politics and the law. Politics and the law this evening. For Constitutional Day on September the 17th, we presented a program to Electoral College. And it was the history, the po political, and constitutional aspects. We had a spirited debate with Jonathan Earl, Paul Shoemaker, and Rick Levy. We discussed, are we voting for the president or are we voting for the electors? We heard we vote too often for the unknown electors. Campaigns spend so much time on voter registration, and then they go with GOT TV to get out the vote. It is hard work to turn out the vote. We try to make it as easy as possible. We have absentee voting. We have advanced voting. We allow people to just request a ballot, send it to the home, and they can mail it back. We do all kind of things to try and make sure that people vote. Polls are open all day. And in Kansas, from 7 to 7 p.m. At the end of the day, it's time to count the votes. After the polls close at 7 p.m., and that's depending on how long the lines are, and it may stay longer, but if you're in line, at 7 o'clock, you have that opportunity to vote. Perhaps at that point, we have provisional ballots. People often ask, are they counted? And how do I know that they are counted? What happens to the ballots that are received from overseas? The ones that come from Iraq, the ones that come from Afghanistan. How do I know there is ballot security? Can someone tinker with the ballot machine? What if the machines are not working properly? Who can I tell? Who can I let know? How can I be assured that my vote will go to the person I voted for? Do I still have to worry about hanging chads? Shouldn't I get a voter's receipt? If the answer is no, why not? That's the question I hear the most from my constituents. How else can I verify that I voted and for whom I voted? Especially when there are contested races involving recounts and more recounts and more recounts. Talk about politics and the law, ballot security and other roles. The 2000 election gave new meaning to does my vote count? Who protects the voter? The one who always vote? That individual we work so hard to register and get to the polls? Who determines the final outcome of the election? The voters or is it the law? This evening we will hear about politics and the law, voter security, and other roles. I will now introduce the presenters. About Ben Ginsburg. Benjamin Ginsburg graduated from the University of Pennsylvania in 1974. He earned a law degree from Georgetown University in 1982. He is co-chair of the Patton Boggs Public Policy Department and represents numerous political parties, political campaigns, candidates, members of Congress, and state legislatures. In both the 2004 and 2000 election cycle, Mr. Ginsburg served as the national counsel to the Bush-Cheney presidential campaign. He played a central role in the 2000 Florida recount. He also represents the campaigns and leadership packs of numerous members of the Senate and the House. He serves as counsel to the Republican Governors Association and has wide experience on the state legislative level from directing Republican redistricting efforts nationwide following the 1990 census and being actively engaged in the 2001-2000 round of redistricting. In addition to advertising on election law issues, particularly those involving federal and state campaign finance laws, ethics rules, redistricting, communication law, and election recounts and contests. Mr. Ginsburg represents clients before Congress and the state legislature. Before he went into law, he spent five years as a newspaper reporter on the Boston Globe, Philadelphia Evening Bulletin, the Riverside, Press Enterprise. <laughs> Very diverse. About Stanley Brand. Since founding a Washington, D.C. based law firm in 1983, Stanley Brand has specialized in cases at the intersection of politics, criminal law, and communication in the Washington Echo Chamber, according to former client George Stephanopoulos in his best selling autobiography, All Too Human A Political Education. From 76 to 83, Mr. Brand served as general counsel to the U.S. House of Representatives under Speaker Thomas Tip O'Neill and was the House chief legal officer responsible for representing the House, its members, officers, and employees in connection with the legal procedures and litigation arising from the conduct of their official activities. Since leaving the House, 
Mr. Brand has also had a succession of high-profile political and public correction cases and clients, including former White House aide George Stephanopoulos in the Whitewater investigation. He was featured in the Washingtonian Magazine 2002 survey of the 75 best lawyers in Washington. In 99, Mr. Brand was named by the Legal Times to the magazine White Collar Crime Top Gun list for knowing when to fight and when not to fight. He has appeared widely on networks, public and cable television, including ABC News, ABC Nightline, All Things Considered, Lou Dobbs Tonight. Also been on Hardball. As you can see, we have before us two very different attorneys, different perspectives, but both respecting the law. Tonight, I think you will have a very spirited debate and certainly you will find out more about ballot security and other roles. And sometimes, how much does the law determine what happens in campaigns? It is my pleasure to turn it over to our director, Bill Lacey, who will conduct the interview. Thank you very much, uh, Barbara. It's a little bit hot, isn't it? <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, thank all of you for coming out. We really appreciate your attendance tonight. Uh, ben, Stan, I want to start by setting a little bit of context before we get into some more specific issues. Uh, let's start with a very basic question. Uh, each of you at some point made a decision to become attorneys, and beyond that you decided that you are going to make uh, kind of the area of political law a pretty significant part of your practice. What led you both to that? personal decision? Uh, my father <coughs> said that um, he was always delighted that I found a profession in which my antisocial behavior was um, an asset. Um, there were two kinds of kids on my block. Half became cops and half became defense lawyers. Um, they were sort of the opposite sides of the same coin. I didn't even apply to law school until after I had graduated and gotten a job in Washington. Um, for me, the law was never an end in itself. It became a means to an end, which was basically um, participating in, in politics in, in a different way, as a counselor, and as an advisor, as a litigator, um, as somebody who, uh, like Ben, I think, um, likes to mix it up in the political arena in, in a professional advisory way. And so I think that, for me, was the key. Uh, well, I, I was a newspaper reporter and um, quickly got overwhelmed by my ignorance. I was living in Riverside, California, and at the time, Riverside was the fastest growing county in the country, and I was covering the county planning board, and 100,000 permits for new homes went beneath my eyes in a six-month period, and I had no idea what questions to ask. So uh, that led to the decision to go to law school. And then the, um, the uh, sort of, I, I practiced libel defense law for three years. Uh, but as any of you who are lawyers may find out, sometimes the partners you work for force you to, um, or suggest that you look for different areas of the <laughs> law. And, um, and uh, so there were some guys doing political law. Uh, on the Republican side, and so I eagerly signed up to be the grunt associate doing that. And as a young associate, they gave me the hours churning exercise of researching all the recounts in the House of Representatives. So they represented the House administration at the time, and uh, it was a completely unused product the first year I did it. And I dusted it off two years later, which was 1984, which turned out to be. Uh, the year of one of the bloodiest recounts in U.S. House history in, uh, in southwest Indiana. And so the day after uh, the election, I was the little kid who knew the answers to what you do in a House recount. And one thing led to another, and it's all Joe Gaylord's fault at the end of the day. So your, your first actual political job was, uh, or at least partisan political job, was with Joe at the Congressional Committee? Yes. Okay. Now. Can both of you kind of say what your practice entails? I mean, obviously, we're going to talk probably a disproportionately share of our time tonight about campaign finance and about 
uh, voter fraud, ballot security, those two topics. But, but uh, Stan, you and I were talking beforehand. Your, your practice is much larger than that, but it's largely related to politics. Talk about that a little yeah, bit. Yeah, I guess I've gotten most of my clients through politics, although my practice isn't uh, wholly political. I, just to give some sort of top tens, um, you know, I wound up representing Larry Craig two summers ago in the Senate Ethics Committee flap over his uh, arrest in the Minneapolis airport. I wound up representing Major League Baseball in the steroid hearings in 1985 when they were subpoenaed to the Congress. Um, I have a very active um, criminal trial practice, and that basically came through politics. That came through my good friend Tony Coelho, who invited me on a mule trip to the High Sierras one summer, where I met this guy who was a savings and loan kingpin, it turned out, um, and he was regaling me of this horrible story of what was happening to him um, in his savings and loan. I wound up um, getting hired by him and going actually to trial with him um, in Iowa. And so my practice is a diverse litigation, criminal practice with political overlay. Um, and mo most of what I get, I get because at some point you get a profile as handling those types of cases. Um, you know, I, my kids, when they were little, asked me, what do you do, Daddy? And I said, you know, it's kind of like the guy in the emergency room who gets the heart attacks and the gunshot victims. That's what I get in my legal practice. <laughs> ben, what about you? Um, well, I was, um, I was lucky enough in an eight-year period to be the in-house counsel for the Republican Congressional Committee and then the Senatorial Committee and then the Republican National Committee. And um, I had difficulty imagining a more fun job than that. Um, but the pressures of having a family sort of meant I had to look around in private practice. And I've been lucky enough to recreate those fun years I had working at the, at the political committees in private practice. So uh, I do a lot of campaign finance work representing candidates in the political parties, vendors in the process. Um, we, uh, the, the, the ethics investigations that we do are, are kind of a byproduct of that representation. Redistricting is kind of seasonal work about once a decade, but, um, but awfully interesting and important when it comes up. And um, from time to time I get interested in a legislative issue and I work for the largest lobbying shop in, in Washington, so I'll, I'll do some legislative work from time to time as well. This is, uh, this is kind of tough to answer, but just give me just a wild bar ballpark from each of you on roughly what percent of your time you spend on clearly politics or political related cases. 98. 98? Maybe 25%. I mean, I, you know, it tends to be the stuff that gets, gets noticed. You know, I had a right. case in the Supreme Court last spring um, where we actually <clears throat> uh, got a case where we got the Supreme Court to strike down a provision of the campaign finance law, the so-called Mil Millionaire's Amendment, which was uh, basically an incumbent protection act by another name. And um, that got a lot of, you know, visibility and a lot of press, but that isn't the mainstay, you know, of what I do. It's just the part that gets the most attention. Yeah. I want to ask both of you to, to answer this, and, and Ben, we'll start with you, but, you know, what is the most high stakes, really critical uh, activity uh, or involvement that you've had in politics. Now, Ben, I'm guessing you're going to say it's Florida 2000, right? Well, there, there, there will never be anything like Florida in 2000. Talk a little bit about it and, and your role and kind of what you took away from that. Well, I was the the counsel, the outside counsel for the uh, for the Bush campaign, and. We prepared, as you always prepare, going into an election for a recount, which means you assign a bunch of lawyers to write the rules of all the different states. And you say to yourself with a fair degree of confidence based on history that there'll never be a presidential recount. There may be one in the Senate. There likely will be some in the House. But, and I actually made this prediction on the Monday before the election when we were sitting around having lunch, there will never ever be a presidential 
recount in, in our lifetimes. Um, and people remind me of that fairly frequently. Now. Uh, but we were sort of sitting there uh, on uh, election night in 2000. And to set the scene about 8.30 at night, uh, the networks all called Florida for Gore, which was a devastating blow to us because without Florida, George Bush was not going to become president. So everyone got pretty depressed at that, but, but the numbers guys recognized that there was something wrong with the call, that the, the numbers were just coming in differently from that. So about 10.30, the networks pulled back their call that Florida had gone for Gore, and we got all excited, and uh, then waited till 1.30 in the morning when all of a sudden the network started announcing that Bush had won Florida, which meant we won the election, which meant we were thrilled beyond belief. I mean, it's the culmination of a lot of work, uh, hugging, kissing, tears. Everyone goes pouring out of the headquarters uh, in Austin and down towards the state capitol, which, if you remember, is lit up awfully dramatically. And it's 40 degrees, and it's raining, and it's really uncomfortable. And nobody cared because it just won the presidency of the United States. And we stood there waiting for Al Gore's concession and stood there and stood there and stood there. And all of a sudden, on the giant jumbo screens they had up there, uh, Candy Crowley <coughs> filled up the screens and said, um, give me a mic, Al Gore's withdrawn his concession. And that's one of those kick, get a kick right in the gut. So, oh my God, what just happened here? We all go pouring back through the rain, which is now really cold and wet, um, to the headquarters and sit there and wait and wait and wait. And the numbers keep getting tighter and tighter and tighter. And the moment that I'll never forget is Don Evans came up to my desk. He was the chairman of the campaign and said, it's a recount. You better start, start scrambling people. So political people are great about um, mobilizing in a hurry, shall we say. And so by 8 o'clock that morning, there were about a dozen private jets headed from Austin into, into Florida. And I flew in one of the planes and did kind of a, a, a seminar as we flew. And we stopped in Tampa and Orlando and Daytona and ended up in Tallahassee. And um, from that moment, I was um, more or less the, the quarterback of the, the recount effort to Jim Baker's coach. And other than, a, <clears throat> excuse me, other than a case of pneumonia, what did you get out of standing <laughs> in the rain and doing that recount? Well, <clears throat> it, 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 it teaches you a number of things. One of them is and I think this is probably true everywhere, but really true in politics. You just can never anticipate what's going to happen. You always get surprised by it. And you need to be able to react quickly to it. Um, I think the second great lesson that I learned was you really do need a team around you to make anything work. And the legal team that we recruited into Florida was the greatest group of lawyers that all ever practice with and that was absolutely crucial and then just the multi-headed nature of the whole process between the legal work and there were two Supreme Court cases and 36 other cases litigated in Florida in 36 days the political operation to count all the votes um, the communications operation to be able to tell your story and to basically create a sense of legitimacy for your candidate when or if he ultimately um, wins the recount. Stan, you've, you've had an interesting career. What would you kind of single out as uh, uh, the most kind of critical juncture from a political point yeah. of view you've been involved in? I guess the case uh, <clears throat> where I was counsel in the House to uh, various committees who were pursuing the EPA scandal in the 80s and uh, I was the chief legal counsel for the House at that point, and there were a number of issues. Um, President Reagan asserted executive privilege. There were all kinds of um, Department of Justice and FBI investigations into uh, uh, malfeasance at the EPA, and I was the chief legal strategist for the House uh, position, um, which ultimately was litigated um, 
and uh, favorably to our side, at least at that point. Um, and that was a lot of uh, attention and pressure for me at that age. I was 32 years old, and arrayed against me was the White House counsel, the Solicitor General, the Attorney General, and everybody um, and their brother in the administration. And yet I was able to somehow navigate the shoals of the litigation, the politics inside the House of Representatives. Um, one of my proudest moments was the nonpartisan, bipartisan vote that we got on the House floor to begin the legal process of contempt. Um, uh, the late Henry Hyde was somebody who I had a good relationship with, was a Republican, who I revered. Right. Um, and I went to him and laid out the case. And he said, well, you know, I'm going to be with you. And when we went to the floor, instead of it being a partisan breakdown, he brought about 65 Republicans, which gave us unbelievable credibility, um, and not just in the media, but in the courts, because it didn't look like a political investigation. It looked like a House of Representatives investigation. That was a terribly proud moment. And then the, the representation of George Stephanopoulos, where you're representing somebody in the White House who's very close to the president in a grand jury investigation, and all that brings the media attention, the feeding frenzy that went on in the Whitewater case. Um, and where you have to have, um, and, and I know Ben will appreciate this because he was doing the same thing in Florida, you have to have dexterity, not just as a lawyer, but as an amateur politician and an amateur media person. And you have to keep your eye on the legal ball, but you have to realize you're operating um, in a wider uh, arena than just the pure law. Those two experiences, I would say, were signal for me. Ironically, um, while Ben was leading the charge in Florida, I got a call from um, Lynn Utrecht uh, to ask me to go to Florida to do the same type of work, not in the lead position that Ben was in, but to help on the Gore side. And I had just left ABC Studios, where I signed a contract to be the Bob Costas of Bush v. Gore. <laughs> And so my job for the next six weeks was to go to my office and wait for the fax machine to send the 36 legal opinions. Um, they didn't all come out on the same day, but each day would they, and the fax would come and I would read it and I would run to the studio. And in 30 words or less, I was supposed to explain to the people of America what was going on legally. Um, and if you thought it was complex, uh, watching it on TV, it was just as complex for the lawyers because they were in state court, they were in federal court. They were on so many different tracks. And it was very, very difficult to explain and divine the law from these um, very obtuse rulings and try to explain to the public with some degree of uh, uh, you know, simplicity that, that laymen could understand what was going on. So that was a, uh, I mean, that was a great experience. Both, both of you have had some incredible experiences in your career. Let's kind of focus in for a couple questions on campaign finance. Um, uh, at least in our lifetimes, the, uh, the, the first big campaign finance reform was post-Watergate in the mid-70s. And then we kind of decide, as, as our Congress decides, that, well, that system isn't really working, even though it was spawned by the corruption of Watergate and the big money and everything. That system isn't really working, so we're going to go to McCain-Feingold. I'm curious as to uh, basically, you know, do you guys feel that it's an improvement? Is, are things better now than they were? I, Congress is good at two things, doing nothing and overreacting. Um, <laughs> And if you scour the <clears throat> Watergate history, which I have, um, you will not find that campaign finance was particularly a large element of the Watergate scandal. Um, it was mostly about abuse of power. Um, it was mostly about the, the break-in and the cover-up. <clears throat> it had very little to do with campaign finance. That was a, a, a congressional overlay, which in my view over the last 35 years has proven to be largely... Um, ineffective in doing what uh, it was supposed to do. And, and the second point I would make is the uh, written and unwritten purpose of the campaign finance laws is based to me on a faulty premise, and that is that money in politics is evil. Um, and the Supreme Court bought that line in 1974 in Buckley versus Vallejo that there was this corrupting influence of contributions. Um, and as a criminal lawyer, to me, you know, if you bribe somebody with a campaign contribution, it's already a crime. 
Um, in this country, when someone robs the bank, we don't say we need new laws. We prosecute them for robbing the bank. Uh, in the campaign finance area, we have this whole construct that somehow money in politics is evil. And I just, I, I'm maybe not in the mainstream of my own party on that, but I think it's uh, demonstrably provably wrong. Um, and if, if you keep any part of it, for me, you would keep the disclosure part, which I think is, you know, as uh, Justice Frankfurt has said, or, or maybe it was Brandeis, di uh, disclosure is a great disinfectant. Um, but to regulate it the way we have, um, it strikes me as counterproductive. Do you think McCain-Feingold is uh, an improvement or a step backwards? Well, you know, we knocked out part of McCain-Feingold with the, with the Millionaire's Amendment. Um, and the court has whittled away a lot of McCain-Feingold through interpretation um, as not being consistent with the First Amendment protection for free speech. So I think what you're seeing is uh, a, a retrenchment of that um, scheme, and I think we will continue to see that as long as we have the current makeup of the court. And I, for one, welcome it. Well, uh, I, the only redeeming feature of the current campaign finance scheme is it enabled me to get a couple of kids through college. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it, it really is, I mean, I agree with, with what Stan said. It really is an overregulation in an area where overregulation has some pretty negative impacts on the way the process should work, I think. It's not true in this year's presidential election, but it is very true, for example, in the Senate and House races, where in the most contested races, the amount of money being spent by outside groups is much greater than what the candidates can spend. So we have succeeded in regulating the candidates who we're supposed to be voting in to the point where the agendas in races are far too often set by outside voices who have their own special, very narrow uh, agendas. And the result of that is that um, the agendas really do get truncated in bad ways, uh, and the candidates themselves can't control what, what, what the voters get to hear. Um, McCain-Feingold has really served to cripple the political party committees uh, by saying that it is basically illegal to use money legal under state law to help out with a party-wide program. Now that has the effect of whittling away the influence of the parties in their big tent and instead empowering special interest groups. There are, there are fundamentally three things that the party committees can do. The three M's. They can provide money, they can mobilize voters, they can put out a message under which their candidates can broadly run. The raising of money because of McCain-Feingold has really um, empowered special interest groups who can bundle large contributions or individuals who have good Rolodexes to replace the party committees in terms of funding candidates. Mobilization efforts are much more, on at least the Senate and House level, the, the product of special interest groups who mobilize their members, think about <laughs> unions or the National Rifle Association. And in terms of messaging, you see more ads in contested House and Senate races paid for by third party groups than either the candidates or, or the parties. That is, I think, not particularly helpful to, uh, to the way the system ought to work. Does it bother the two of you that the parties have local representatives, elected officials, you know who the leadership is, all that? Those people you can walk up to on the street, you can tell them, oh, I saw that ad you're running, that's despicable, you need to take that off. So there's a certain degree of accountability, it seems, built in there, while there's no accountability built into, like, the 527s. Yeah. No, absolutely. I think, I think that's true, and it's really a, a phenomenon that's only going to it's only going to get in, uh, accentuated. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's free speech. You know, if you take the jurisprudence of the Supreme Court on the First Amendment, there's not much you can do about that. Um, <clears throat> there is some accountability through the IRS now, but not, um, not very meaningfully. But that's just a function of um, 
the system we have? I don't have a problem with the third party groups having their First Amendment right to speak. The, the, the difficulty that I've got is that you're suppressing the ability the of the candidates right. and parties to, to participate on the same level or a larger level. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let, let's shift topics for just a few minutes uh, before we open it up to, to Q&A from our audience to the integrity of our elections. Now, it, we hear especially after uh, 2000 about vote fraud and uh, uh, I'm curious, do you guys think that is a really huge widespread problem or is it more of an isolated problem? Um, I think that uh, it, is, it is not a widespread phenomenon or problem, although I think that there are charges that go back and forth between the two parties about fraud, which the Republicans see a lot, and voter suppression, which the Democrats see a lot. Uh, there is a lot of time spent by both parties trying to say that the other is guilty of either fraud or suppression. Uh, I think it's sort of two sides of the same coin. I think neither party has made a convincing case that it's that it's widespread. The truth is, I think the coin that it's the two sides of is really race, race relations in America. And so it's a really dangerous place for the country to be, to be casting these charges back and forth and raising suspicions uh, about them. I agree with Ben, and I, I would add a third uh, element, which is, you know, the old saw about don't watch um, legislation or sausage being made. Um, add a third one, elections being counted. I think any time you peel back the curtain to something that people had previously relied on as being uh, well run and orderly and show that it isn't that, um, and I would suggest that historically in America it has never been that, um, and you put the kind of pressure that we've put on the electoral system in terms of focus and turnout and, and expectation, you're going to have the kinds of issues erupt. Um, and I think we're heading into a period where um, we're really going to be examining the way we conduct elections as we try to ma match technology to this expanded expectation um, that people, you know, should exercise their franchise. It's very important that they do. And um, as Ben was saying in our, in our dinner, the credibility of the people who are involved need to be supported so that we can keep the voter turnout and keep people involved and engaged in the process lest they lose, uh, you know, it's like the 1919 Black Sox scandal, you know. Boy, it wasn't on the level. Who wants to watch a baseball game after that? So, uh, and it wasn't until Babe Ruth came back that baseball really returned. So I wouldn't want to see that happen in our electoral process. Should voters be concerned about the, the differences from state to state and even within states in terms of the way votes are counted, the way registrations are conducted, all the different processes and rules? No more than they should be concerned that, you know, the requirements and the procedures for marriage are different in one state than another, getting a license or buying a home or doing anything else. As we learned in, in uh, 2000, or at least I learned, um, the presidential election really isn't a national election. It's 50 state elections. And um, people just have to get used to uh, acclimating themselves to a state and a county and a local system as opposed to some notion that these elections are conducted on uniform national standards because they're not. I have a little bit of a different take. I, I think that we celebrate in this country the differences between states. So I don't think this is something that will ever be federalized, even although some will, will think it's desirable. I do think you have a bigger problem within states, uh, because it is true that from county to county, the reliability of the way the counting process takes place, either because of machines or people, can vary. And one of the hallmarks for credibility in an election is that similarly cast and marked ballots will be counted the same way throughout a state. The way it's set up now with such different procedures, even from county to county in the same state, uh, because of machines or again because of personnel, can lead to a, a result that just doesn't 
have any credibility to it. <laughs> and to the extent the Bush versus Gore Supreme Court case counts for anything, uh, it would be that you at least ought to have uniform counting and casting within a, within a state. Uh, both the presidential campaigns now have assembled these big armies of attorneys who are ready to fly in and, and, and take charge in, in case they're needed. Um, I, I'm curious. Uh, I'm curious from a contextual point of view, but also from your opinion of where we are today. I mean, is this is it really different in this respect and that mobilization since uh, 2000, or is it really kind of were we doing that before and it just was never necessary, so nobody heard about it? And then secondly, kind of what are the issues? How are they assembling those teams, and what are the issues are they talking about, and and you know how are they organized? Well, we should all be very, very afraid of a lot of over-caffeinated lawyers in polling places when they first open in the morning, <laughs> uh, and probably when they close at night. Um, there was always a lawyer's effort uh, before 2000, doing, dealing with many of the same issues as now, although 2000 put such a, a microscope on everything that it really has kind of gotten on steroids um, since then. Uh, and, and so it's become much more of a rallying cry for both parties. Uh, and for better or for worse, it's really become part of the get out the vote mechanisms for each party to yell about either fraud, fraud or suppression. I mean, in terms of the issues that uh, both sides are dealing with now, it's obviously the, um, the reliability of the voting machines. It is whether uh, the voter registration rolls are either valid or invalid. And by that I mean um, whether people, when they walk into a polling place, if their name doesn't appear on the voter registration list in the right form, will they be allowed to cast a ballot or not? There is always concern over the machines and whether they'll work properly and whether there are enough machines because if there are long lines will people decide not to vote and does that advantage one side over the other side. Uh, there's a lot of talk amongst the lawyers about just keep your eyes open and react uh, if you see anything that, that looks funny. Um, I think this is the first election where the phenomenon of camera phones and YouTube will be married up. And my guess is if you go looking at YouTube on election day, you're going to see all sorts of remarkable things <laughs> going on in, in polling places around the country that will be taken by one side or the other to um, sort of inoculate against a bad result. I'd go back to the point that Ben made um, <clears throat> in, his, uh, in his very first response, and that is we never envisioned contested elections on a presidential level. We always had targeted races in the House and Senate where we knew there'd be a contest and the lawyers would zoom in on a congressional district or a state. Um, to have it done at a national level is uh, awe-inspiring. Um, and I think it's just part of what hap has happened in our society is, you know, when in doubt, litigate. Um, and don't you know? And and litigation as a shootout at the OK Corral, which is part of our you know cultural heritage. Um, if they have ten lawyers, we have to have ten lawyers, and you know we're all going to go march off to court and settle the election. And I think that's just become part of the fabric. And each side is suspicious more than ever of the other's motives and what they're going to do. And you don't want to be outflanked by the other party. So you organize this massive um, lawyer recruitment on a national level, and um, it, it, you know it, it, that's what it has become. Whether this case, whether this election will prove to be another in a string of those, I don't know. I think close elections tend to breed that type of um, response. If it's not close, then I think it will sort of fade for a while until we get the next close election. Um, but there are all these young lawyers out there who now see people like Ben and I and say, you know, I want to be like Ben and Stan when I grow up and go <laughs> sue and go off to court and, you know, contest elections. Got to be bald. Um, so, 
you know, it's just the inevitable march of lawyers in America. I have one last question, then we're going to open it up to all of you. But Ben, I was amused when you were saying how on Monday before Election Day, Tuesday in 2000, you were commenting how we would never in our lifetime see, you know, what happened the next day in essence. And, and I was particularly amused about that because I would have said exactly the same thing. As a matter of fact, I left the day after the election and spent 10 days on two mountains in Mexico and missed what was arguably one of the most dramatic periods of time in presidential politics in my life because I never expected that to happen. So my question for both of you is, will that happen again in our lifetimes? <laughs> well, the context of that conversation was lawyers' fantasies, which is really not an oxymoron. <laughs> um, no, the answer is no, it's not going to happen again in our lifetime. I mean, the historical averages would tell you no, and, you know, history is the, is the happening of unanticipated events, so maybe. How's that for a lawyer-like answer? It's very good. Well, I, I would agree, except that what I've observed in, in my lifetime is that history telescopes. Um, when I was a young fellow working for Tip O'Neill, um, the House was considering whether to impeach Richard Nixon. The last impeachment before Richard Nixon had been Andrew Johnson in 1867. When I sat there uh, involved peripherally as I was in the Nixon impeachment, I never imagined that the next time there was going to be an impeachment would have been a mere 30 years later. Um, so these aren't necessarily hun like the 100 year floods anymore. Um, and it's conceivable to me that not this time and maybe not the next several times, um, but I think once you lower that bar, you create the conditions for having it repeat itself. And I wouldn't be surprised if we had another one of those within our lifetimes. So we should be all looking out for 2028 or 2032. <laughs> so that mark guess. that down in your calendars and be, be ready to go. We're going to open up to... Uh, we're going to open up to Q&A now. Uh, please raise your hand. Wait for a, a cordless mic. We have a lot of students here tonight. Uh, so I hope you guys will take advantage of this opportunity to ask questions. We have about uh, 30 minutes or so to do that if we have enough questions. Peter, you got somebody? Well, I have, I have a serious and then maybe a not so serious question. Um, I'd like their uh, comments with regard to the Electoral College vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, popular vote in light of... Uh, uh, what again could be a situation where you could have a popular vote and perhaps a different electoral college. And then Mr. Ginsburg, I'd like to know if you saw Recount on HBO <laughs> and I'd like to know uh, whether or not it bared any relationship to, to reality or at least a little bit of a critique uh, relative to that uh, film. You want to go on the first question? The first question being uh, Electoral College. Yeah, the Electoral College. I don't know. I, I like the Electoral College. I, I don't like tinkering with things that the framers put in. We revere them. We say they're the most brilliant minds of the last 300 years, and then we keep wanting to change what they did. Um, there are some... Uh, you know, the odd thing was that in 2000, the expectation was exactly the reverse prior to the election. The scenarios were that George Bush was going to win the popular vote, and Al Gore was going to win the electoral vote. So all the Democrats were in high dudgeon about the uh, elect well, not in high dudgeon about the Electoral College uh, at that point. So, you know, you have to be careful because you can change the system and then be a victim of that change. I would want to make a very sustained, hard review of the Electoral College system to make sure that all of the things it brings. Uh, that some of them aren't worth keeping, including candidates to go to places like Montana and Utah and other places that, but for the Electoral College, might not ever see a um, presidential candidate. And I think, actually, this time bears that out. Um, Barack Obama's campaign focused on some of these smaller caucus states to the uh, great dismay of the Hillary Clinton camp who didn't pay any attention to that. So, you know, I think democracy should work in all 50 states, not just in New York and California and Florida and Texas. 
And I worry that when you change the delicate balance that the framers put together, you're going to upset the apple cart. Well, I really agree with Stan um, about that. I mean, I, I think in anything it's important to know what the rules are and you play by the rules. Um, and the Electoral College does have the, the benefit of, um, of history behind it. I think if you were to change the Electoral College, get rid of it, and have a popular vote, you're really making some profound changes that, that benefit certain special interest groups. I mean, the reality is if there was a popular vote, uh, it would really shift the balance of power in this country to urban areas. Uh, because that's where the people are. And so if, you had a, if the popular vote governed, you would just go to the most, popular, uh, the most populated areas. Uh, that would tend to emphasize urban concerns, uh, and suburban concerns would get slighted. Exurban concerns would get even more slighted, and rural concerns in the country would not even be on the agenda or the thought process for the for the presidential candidates. And Stan is absolutely right that a number of the small states who now are seeing a fair amount of attention uh, would be um, completely ignored if you, um, if you just had the popular vote. So, you know, kind of give us the rules of the game and we'll play by them, but recognize that there are profound changes uh, that, that would occur if you got rid of the Electoral College. Um, I was asked about recount in the dinner, and, and I, my, my sort of standard line now is, well, we won the recount, but the Democrats won the movie. Uh, and, that, <laughs> and that pretty much is what the movie was. I mean, it was, it was, um, it was great to see something you've been involved in portrayed on the, on the screen. I mean, the, the, my character was really a composite character of the work of dozens of truly outstanding lawyers um, from somebody who lived through it you know we were it was 36 days and we were you know 18 hours a day was a short day during that period the movie compresses the whole thing into 116 minutes so it feels like that there's a lot of stuff kind of left out um, from our own partisan perspective it really was sort of the Democrats show um, and you know that's that's kind of what showbiz is and that's uh, that's fine. Do you have a question on this side? Right here Peter in the second row. <clears throat> First of all in a side comment given your diverse interests but opposite parties I'm surprised at the great amount of agreement my question is, do you feel that shortening the time frame in which candidates are allowed or encouraged to, to uh, campaign would help the system and the waste of the money? I mean, my view on that is the same as the Electoral College. Um, <clears throat> on the Democratic side, let's look at where we started. Hillary Clinton was the presumptive nominee before the thing even started. And her team front end loaded the system, the primary, so that by March 1, she would be the victor. And look at what happened. Um, I think you have to let democracy work its will. You have to let it work its way across a broad sweep of people and issues and venues. Um, <clears throat> and I don't think it's like a you know, chemistry experiment where you try to tinker with elements of it to satisfy some uh, fetish over order. It's democracy. And may the best man or woman win under the rules as they exist at the time. The brilliance of Obama's strategy was that he figured out two things that somehow escaped all the brains in the Hillary camp, including some have been around democratic politics for 40 years. One, proportional representation, which is a bedrock of our system. They figured out that they could go into these big states and lose the popular vote, and under the way the rules are written in the Democratic Party, come away with almost as many delegates. And they found out, and they figured out, caucus states. Um, and those two things allowed them to draw even and ultimately win. So I, I don't like 
trying to control the system from outside with um, you know, preconceived notions of how it's supposed to work. I think it should be basically a civilized free-for-all. And the best man or woman should win. And, and in terms of what has happened on the Democratic side, I think that has served the Democrats' interest. That has seasoned, leavened, and strengthened the Democratic candidate. And uh, to some extent, I think the same thing happened on the Republican side. John McCain was written off in August of 2007. He was dead in the water. He was never going to make it. And look at what happened. So um, there's got to be, you know, there's got, you've got to let the grassroots and the, and the people's will be worked, it seems to me. Yeah, I mean, I, to be honest, I don't think we spend enough time or enough money looking at these folks. I mean, they do. Campaigns are tough. They are really difficult. They they're both painful and exhilarating to go through. But it's it's really a test for the most important job we have. And I don't think for a second that there is too much exposure that these folks can get to the voters and given the amounts of money that we spend on other things and other advertising um, I don't think we're spending too much on politics. You have a question on this side. Um, <clears throat> this may be not so much a uh, question as, I guess, a confirmation of the things that you were talking about, about the likelihood of uh, voter fraud. Um, I think it was the uh, Princeton uh, meta-analysis of polls website that uh, estimated that to, for fraud to uh, affect the election, it would take a turnover of something like 1.7 million votes. Now, uh, that's very reassuring if that's uh, an, an accurate guess because it doesn't seem likely to happen. But I wonder, uh, are you, uh, you know, confident that we're not going to have fraud on a scale that would uh, flip the election one way or the other? Well, I mean, the problem is if the presidential campaign hinges on a state that one candidate wins by 532 votes. Um, I, I suppose it is somehow, it's not 1.7 million votes in that case that flips the election. But I think that um, there are ways in the polling places to actually ensure that even the fraud that seems to be being perpetrated by ACORN doesn't ultimately affect the outcomes. Don't forget, when we're hearing about fraud, we're hearing about registration fraud, not about voting fraud. And the proof on voting fraud is even skimpier than the registration fraud. So I am reasonably confident that fraud is not going to influence anything but maybe the most local city race or county race. I would agree with that. I think that the, uh, you know, the bet noir of fraud is overblown. That people, uh, they want to suspect that they lost for a reason that's outside their control. Um, and I think most elections are not close enough that you could demonstrate a um, outcome based on the very few cases where you have actual voting fraud. Um, I've done a bunch of uh, contested elections in the House where, you know, the number of votes cast is much smaller than on a presidential level. And you really get down to a granular level of reviewing these things. And sometimes uh, there was one in the House uh, years ago, Sam Gadenson in Connecticut, four votes. He won by four votes, if you can imagine that, in, you know, in a 500,000 person district. So when you actually get down to cases I think the the provable examples of fraud are a lot less than the media hypes um, at least post 2000. There is there is the issue of, of mistake and sloppy records however 
and I did the Gageson recount, so I'm familiar with it. And while I'm convinced there was no fraud that anyone could ever prove in any way, shape, manner, or form, <coughs> I'm also convinced that the voter registration rolls were so messed up that more than four people were probably turned away who should have been able to vote, and more than four people voted who shouldn't have been allowed to vote. That's not fraud. That is the sloppiness of the system that. And that you could Stan just never get it. You could never before, get at that. But you could never all. get at yeah. that, right? We're going to stay on this side because this gentleman right here had a question right in front of you, Peter. Kind of topical. Um, today, Governor Christ in Florida, uh, he overturned a law that was put in place to limit the amount of time that polls, uh, polling places could be open for early voting. And my question was, does that serve any legal purpose or is it pretty much a political thing in your opinion? Are you familiar with it? I'm not. My guess is that if some Democrat thinks that he couldn't get away with that or he did it you know, outside the law, they're going to challenge it. So, I, I mean, I think the limitations on uh, when polls can be open are practical. Is, you know, how long can you keep them open? How do you staff them? How do you, uh, you know, how do you uh, manage that system? Um, I would imagine if somebody, if, if somebody thought he overstepped his bounds, that's going to be in court. I'd agree with that. So either he had, you know, maybe he had the discretion to do that, and he made a, he made a judgment. He overturned. I'm sorry. He overturned a law that what? Basically, in Florida, the, for early voting, polling could only be open and then eight hours total across the weekend. In order to accommodate the times, actually expanded that to twelve hours per day and twelve hours. So my question really was more in the spirit of the law, if you had any idea why such a thing would be put in place for reasons versus... Well, I mean, it's, an in it's interesting that Charlie Crist, who's a Republican governor, would do that when at least the conventional wisdom is the early voting is much more Obama-driven than McCain-driven. Um, Charlie Crist is also the governor who overturned the Florida law that stopped felons from voting. And so there are now 130,000 people who are on the rolls in Florida who couldn't vote before. Um, again, the conventional wisdom is they ain't Republicans. Uh, so I, I think Charlie has got his good government hat on and uh, thinks that everyone who wants to go out to vote gets to vote. He's also mad at McCain because they're fighting about stuff. <laughs> Question right here. Um, I would be interested in the Ted Stevens uh, case. Uh, is it legitimate position for him to take to say, I'm still going to stand for re-election uh, because I'm claiming that it was an unfair verdict? Oh, absolutely, I think. I, you know, I did some research uh, when I was counsel to the House um, into the uh, early days of the House of Representatives and the, uh, the uh, English Parliament. Um, and there's a theory uh, under the parla Lex Parliamentary that if you are reelected after a conviction, I mean, he's legitimately on the ballot, and your constituents knowing that you've been convicted, re-elect you. That's the ultimate decision of the people. Um, now, arrayed against that is the constitutional power of the House and Senate to discipline members for disorderly conduct and with a two-thirds vote, expel them. The House of Representatives has doubted its authority to expel a member who has returned to the House after the constituents, aware of his transgressions, have re-elected him. And in fact, there was a famous case involving a guy from Vermont named Matthew Lyon, who was expelled and re-elected to the House four times. Um, and the last time, an angry mob went to jail in Vermont and threatened to bust him out of jail and lynch the sheriff. 
So to me, you know, whatever Ted Stevens' transgressions were and what his appeals are, he, if he's reelected, he has an absolute right to come back to the Senate. The people of Alaska aren't troubled by electing someone who's been convicted of a felony. I don't think it's up to the rest of the country's representative to tell the people of Alaska they can't have him. Um, and I don't want to advertise on TV, but I'd be happy to take that case. I think there are serious constitutional questions about whether the Senate could expel a member having been, whose conduct has been explicitly condoned by, his elect, by the electorate in the intervening period. Well, I think Stan's absolutely right about that. The, the practical nature of the Senate is that they're, they're not going to expel him until his appeals are, are resolved. That's going to take a long time in the District of Columbia. So he will either be reelected or not reelected, and that's ultimately going to determine what the Senate does. We have time for one last question right here. I would like your opinion on which would be the best for the country, to have the President and Congress in the same party or to have the president uh, of one party and the Congress of the other party? I've seen it both ways. When I came to Washington in 1971, um, President Nixon was in the White House. The Democrats controlled the Congress. They controlled the House of Representatives up to 1994 for a period of 40 continuous years. Um, then the Republicans took over in 94, and we had, you know, a, a um, president of the one party and the Congress of another. There's been some sense since then that the country likes um, checks and balances on their politicians. It looks this time as if we may have both a Democratic president and an overwhelming Congress. Now, as a partisan Democrat, I, I, I fear for that because I think that that tends to allow the party in power tends to excess and then what happens in the next election is they pay a price for that um, someone needs to discipline people um, and I think the, the payback that occurs in a situation where some party's been out of power and they get back in raises some real issues um, and I, I would worry about that I personally think that if Obama is elected and has overwhelming majorities in the uh, Congress, the, the test for him is going to be the test of leadership and the test for him of posterity will be how well he manages his own party and how well he, if you will, stands up to them where he has to to promote an agenda that's going to work for the whole country. Um, and I think that is the unwritten story for this year, if it happens. Um, so I think it, it's too early to say whether um, one party control works. I don't think it's worked for the Republicans electorally. Really? I think it's... it's <laughs> um, the, the thing that's amazed me is the extent to which Republican members of Congress have marched, marched lockstep with the president and now... Um, are getting killed for it in their districts. Um, you know, it's beyond me why they stuck with him as long as they did, given where the country seemed to be. And, um, you know, split government can be a good thing. Oh, look, I, I think the, the reality of the upcoming election night is the real challenge, if not impossibility, a President Obama would have dealing with a veto-proof Democratic Senate and 250 Democratic members in the House. I mean, I think that is a really, really um, tough challenge for him. I, I also think of, of all the issues we face, the notion of is it a good idea or a bad idea <laughs> is the, I mean, this is the issue about which we have the least control. It's either going to happen because 120 million or 140 million people vote one way or, or the other. And so um, for blovating heads, um, it doesn't, it, it just, it just isn't one of those things that you control or whether you think it's good <laughs> or bad, it's just going to happen. Um, the other thing that I think is true about the question is that the notion of 
checks and balances and divided government is one of those things people like to talk about. I don't know really of any polling that showed that an individual voter going into the polling place thinks I should vote for candidate X or candidate Y because of what it's going to mean on the national stage. People go in and vote because they think either X or Y is the better candidate. I don't think voters think in the cosmic um, idea of whether it's good to have checks and balances or not. Well, gentlemen, this has been outstanding. I want to ask all of you to join me in thanking Stan and Ben for our program tonight. Really was terrific, guys. Thank you. Thank you all for coming out, and uh, we'll see you soon. Thanks. Have a great evening. Good to see you, buddy.